Hey everybody, this is uh, Nevin Gussack. Uh, this is going to be another episode of the Patriotic Populist. With me are two guests of mine here. Uh, we have Rohit, we're going to call it the return of Rohit, the show. <laughs> uh, and then also his uh, girlfriend, uh, who is also very politically active and very politically knowledgeable and engaged, uh, Sarah. And welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Great to How be here. How are you all doing today? Good. Good. It's a fine day. I was vaccinated yesterday, so freedom, you know, uh, freedom is just around the corner. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's great. I got vaccinated two, twice, you know, to two, two shots, uh, Pfizer. I did not transform into some mutant creature or something, you know, like, uh, what was that Will Smith movie? Uh, I Am Legend. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> you know, QAnon's predictions didn't pan out. We didn't turn into the Toxic Avenger or anything like that. So, right. but yeah, more and more people are getting vaccinated even down here in Florida. So that's a step in the right direction. That means, mm -hmm. you know, we can continue to resume, you know, normal activities, whatever that means. And, you know, open up more as long as it's done in a safe and responsible way. Right. Uh, and uh, now everything's great. Got my beer in hand. Uh, so we're going to have a nice discussion. Uh, it's going to be picking up where we last left off uh, from two weeks ago, Rohit. And I look forward to continued engagement. Now, Rohit and Sarah, they're going to be asking me a variety of questions. Now, again, for those of you who didn't listen to the show from two weeks ago, Rohit knew me back in high school when I was a staunch Republican. And I, it's it, I, <laughs> why the change with the times? That's yeah. You know the thing is, is I still like the goals of conservatism. The problem is, is that the Republicans and the Reaganites and the Tea Parties and the corporate stooges really their policies do not execute and reach the goals of conservatism at all. The only thing modern conservatism wants to conserve is the wealth of the big capitalist oligarchs. But enough of me. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of pick up where we last left off. I had a variety of questions I still wanted to ask. Um, and what intrigued me was R Rohit mentioned, Rohit, I'm speaking to the audience, mentioned that he really wasn't super political uh, before meeting Sarah. And between the line of Rohit's work in psychology, and dealing with vulnerable population as majority of his patients, and meeting Sarah, it really opened up his eyes. And in this day and age, politics has become very toxic. So when you have a couple meeting, and one of the things that they really vibe and connect well on is politics, you know, that kind of perked my ears up because just in light of everything that's going on between the chad, deep chasm between the various shades of left and right, I think it's a nice story to tell, an encouraging story to tell is that how one significant other really reeled the other into politics. So... <clears throat> So I'd like the both of you to kind of discuss that. Like, how did, Sarah, how did you awaken Rohit out of his political slumber, let's just say? <laughs> what, what Did he give him coffee or did he give him like speed or jolt cola or something? What's going on here? I had eaten a poisoned apple and once she kissed my lips, it fell off. <laughs> ah, that's a little too much information. What do you have to say, Sarah? <laughs> there was no apple or anything. But what did happen is that um, we there was a social group, and the social group was having a debate night. And this was actually the very first Democratic debate um, in 2000. Was it 2000 or 2019? 2019. 2000, yeah, 2019. 2019. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I first met Rohit. He really... Um, struck me as being very interested in politics at the time, maybe not as passionate as I was, but certainly interested. Mm -hmm. um, I felt that we had that in common and we certainly had similar values. For example, we both believe in healthcare for everybody and mm -hmm. we 
but believe in a living wage and just we just agree on so many different things. No, that's excellent. And what do you have? Do you have anything to add on Rohit regarding that? You know? Yeah, I, you know, I think we were both uh, Bernie Sanders supporters for, uh, you know, for at least, you know, a year. I mean, after we met, we were really very pro Bernie. And then I think mm -hmm. uh, when Joe Biden won the nomination, you know, I think we, like a lot of other Bernie supporters, shifted towards Joe Biden and, you know, not to, you know, <clears throat> to jump ahead, uh, his speech recently, you know, was such a progressive speech uh, mm -hmm. and it really incorporated a lot of the progressive principles. We're really very, you know, very happy with how he's he's done. Mm -hmm. so all right. Yeah, that is definitely a fast forward. So, um, Sarah, were, how did you get interested in politics? Were you always a bit of a political animal like uh, I was and still am? Or were you apolitical? What what drew you into politics and history, current events? Sure. Um, so it's hard to pinpoint exactly one event that drew me into politics, but I have always known just from a very young age that politics is personal. Everything that politicians decide has a direct impact upon all of us. Mm -hmm. um, what politicians decide impacts what food we eat, if we have access to safe drinking water, if we can get health care when we're sick. And mm -hmm. just even as a child, I was very, very aware of that. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I felt very um, different than a lot of other people because I always took politics very, very personally. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just always been a very personal topic to me that I care a lot about. Hmm. So is this something that maybe your parents got you into or has it just happened basically because it just resonated you? You were reading the newspapers, listening to the news and whatnot, and it just struck a chord because it was something important in your value system. Yeah, it was something that has always been imp important in my values for sure. Um, just really seeing, you know, even um, getting into college, like that I was able to get into college because I had enough money to be able to take the SATs. I know that there's waivers for the SATs, but just as an example, I really was able to always pinpoint how politics impacted me and mm -hmm. where my life went. And I would just add that Sarah, I think, cares a lot about other people. I think she's very interested in you know, the well-being of the nation. Uh, and yeah. in politics, you know, it does really matter, you know, what, what laws are decided, um, you know, how much money reaches certain people, what people are allowed to do and not allowed to do. Uh, it, it truly does make um, an impact. So Sarah has, I think, really helped me make the connection between my caring for vulnerable populations, like you mentioned, and the legislation and, you know, rhetoric in a sense that ultimately uh, impacts them. So I would add um, that politics, I think, is much larger than a lot of people realize. Um, for example, I see GoFundMes often for cancer treatment. And the reality is right. you can donate $10, you know, $100, mm -hmm. even $1,000 to help somebody battling cancer through websites like that. But the reality is that if you vote, you there could be, um, there would be no, there could possibly be no GoFundMes. So it's just, I really think that uh, the government just has a direct impact on everything. Mm -hmm. Well, let me interject. That's for those of you who don't know, GoFundMe or Drop Dead. That's the uh, the quote unquote free market health plan. But anyways, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Of most of the Republicans, yeah, uh, it's just a reality. It was the only country in the world that has medical bankruptcies. Everyone else seems to be covered. About forty to fifty percent. The last statistic that I saw. Anyways, go ahead. I just wanted to interject that for the, just in case the audience uh, was not aware of that. So anyways, go ahead. <laughs> but I just see how even issues that haven't personally impacted me right now could impact me in the future. And mm -hmm. people that I know could, you know, obviously terrible, could develop cancer. And I would prefer for people to be able to immediately get cancer treatment versus having to rely on GoFundMe. So these issues are so personal, impacting just everything from what we eat to if we're able to live. Mm -hmm. What kind of alert, uh, line of work are you in again, if you don't mind me asking, just for the audience? Sure. So I actually work as an administrative assistant. However, I got my bachelor's degree in social work. Oh, okay. Good for you. Excellent. 
Excellent. You know, what both of you mentioned earlier about politics, the importance of politics and how it affects people in such an on, honest, <clears throat> excuse me, far-reaching scale, it reminds me of the meme, and, and of course I'm guilty of circulating it as well on my Facebook page. Uh, you're, you might not be interested in politics, but your boss is interested in politics, your landlord is interested in your politics, the bank, your banker is interested in politics, and I think we that what you both were saying earlier really resonated me and made me think of that meme. So uh, it's very, very important. I think this, you know, I think the economic elites would like to have us disinterested and demobilized from politics, so they can preserve their power and privileges. So. Mm -hmm. so. So really what I'm getting from the both of you is your your primary concerns are basically economic and other bread and butter issues. It seems like that's the focus of your activism, your political activism, as well as, uh, you know, some other political discussion groups that Rohit has told me, the political Zoom group, even though that focuses a lot, <clears throat> a lot on, on Trump, but also crept what crept into those discussions, it seems, is also economic issues related, and that includes health care, wages, et cetera. So that, am I correct to say that your big focus is basically economic issues? Sure. You know, I mean, I, I would say I'm pro-labor. Um, mm -hmm. I would say I'm very much, you know, I mean, morally, I think I'm concerned about, you know, the health, the health of the nation, the economic health of the nation, the physical health of the nation. Uh, mm -hmm. and. You know, like we said with medical bankruptcies, I mean, this is some, this is someone like a family or a person who has fallen through the cracks and is not covered and now has to really bankrupt themselves to pay bills. And it's it's uh, it's unfortunate that this is the situation. I, I work uh, in, a, in a poor community mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I work with some homeless people, not, you know, that's not a huge focus of my clinic. But um, Dr. Jim O'Connell, uh, who's a uh, uh, an internist in Boston, he says, homelessness is a prism through which we see the faults or the cracks of society, the, mm -hmm. the certain sectors, including medical, including housing. Uh, so, you know, I think, and, and politics is about power, politics is about money, mm -hmm. and who gets access to those who does not? We pay taxes, and then what happens to that money? Who allocates it? How do they allocate it? What laws are made towards what ends? So it's really, really important. So I would also add that in addition to economic justice, I feel that Rohit and I are also passionate about rights in general mm -hmm. for vulnerable populations. For mm -hmm. example, we both really are passionate about LGBTQA rights. And I really appreciate how Rohit really cares a lot about women's rights as well. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Absolutely. Um, you know, with my position, you know, as I talked about in other shows, uh, my other interview with Rohit and a little bit today, <clears throat> you know, my issues, I started out as a Republican uh, back in really almost eighth grade. And <clears throat> and then I slowly became disillusioned when you do your Q&A of me, we can talk all about that. And I have evolved into what I've termed either a radical civic nationalist, that's my coinage, or patriotic populist, which is the name of this program, or fourth positionism, which is basically neither laissez-faire capitalism or late-stage corporate capitalism. It rejects that along with the libertarianism, which leads to monopolistic late-stage corporate capitalism. But it also rejects the third position, which is national socialism and fascism, because uh, they dub themselves third positionists. And <clears throat> and it also rejects communism, Marxism, Leninism, and socialism as actually properly defined. Not socialism, this bugaboo, which, you know, people that believe in regulated capitalism, according to the Koch network, they're socialists, which is nonsense. It's, it's the degeneration of political discourse, essentially, to call uh, a mild social democrat a socialist. Um, <clears throat> so... You know, I believe I'm a strong believer in free enterprise and harm, hard work ethic and all the rest of it. But we also have to realize, of course, that people who lack resources, it's very difficult for them to pull themselves up, quote, by their bootstraps when they don't have the money to buy the boots or the straps. Right. They don't have the resources. It's just extremely difficult. Um, so I think capital. 
sort of the American version of let them eat cake. So, yeah, yes. you know, you have to have give people access to resources in order to help themselves. You have to have a sort of hybrid of that traditional American bootstraps mentality combined with a new deal. And that's how you get lift people up essentially, and grant them access to social mobility, essentially. They become socially mobile and an entry into becoming themselves property owners, capitalists, professionals, or whatnot, or at least in a situation where they could afford a college for their, uh, for their children who can then become socially mobile and contribute to the economy uh, through that means. Uh, I believe in strong economic nationalism that's rational, where we have to reindustrialize the United States. And I also believe in a form of capitalism that subordinates uh, finance, uh, finance to production and research and development. Uh, I believe in a strong national defense, but I believe both sides of the debate are correct. I think on the one hand, we have to really strongly relook at our foreign commitments and entanglements, but at the same, and we also have to take a look at also reducing the costs uh, that the defense contractors are charging the taxpayer, and as well as corruption in the Pentagon, where general, retired generals can go work for defense corporations. That should be forbidden as far as I'm concerned. Uh, if the companies do, want, do not want to cut costs, or negotiate the costs downwards, then the government should have the power to basically buy them out and nationalize them. Because the most important thing is we still have to produce the weapons to defend us against Russia and China. Uh, it, you know, once you start to make the defense of this country solely uh, a plaything of corporate capitalists, you're not going to get a good defense. You're going to invite corruption as far as I'm concerned. And that money that's saved uh, from by the taxpayers would, could then be automatically put into programs like civil defense, a national health insurance program, or infrastructure. So that's where I'm at with my defense policy. I believe we should obviously beef up our nuclear weapons, their life extension of the uranium is expiring, um, you know, definitely a parity or strategic superiority to Russia and China. And we have to have our defense supply chain uh, for the most part within the borders of the United States of America. Um, I think at the same time, we have to take a look at strong civil defense and because our people are the most is the most important natural resource in this country from the old to the young and we have to any defense policy has to protect them human beings are the nation's most precious natural resource as far as i'm concerned because everything flows from human capital um you know and i could go on and on but that's a little taste of where i'm coming from to expand upon my views it's really not fully right it's not left uh, I think the pro-life platform of conservatism, I think it's wonderful in theory, but in practice, their economic policies have led to the breakup of the American family, stresses in minority communities, as well as in suburban communities. <clears throat> One of the second re biggest reasons why people get abortions, according to the studies by both pro by quote pro-life or pro-choice groups uh, is because of economics, because of wages. People can't afford to have children. But yet, most I think most women and men naturally want to procreate. They want to have families and, and whatnot, but they can't. Why? Because we've been groaning under Reaganism and Clintonism with wage suppression, globalism, union busting, deregulation, and all the rest of it. Uh, in order to have a truly pro-life platform, you need to have health insurance and you need to have uh, shared but earned prosperity in a system of balanced and nationalist capitalism in this country. So a lot of our social maladies are the result of economic dislocation. Yes, some of it is culture, but I think the 
Reaganites like to beat the cultural drum a little too loudly, and they conveniently ignore the role that trickle-down economics plays in the destruction of the American family. We used to have a situation back when our parents were growing up and great-grandparents were growing up where the male could be the sole breadwinner and the woman, if she chooses so, could stay at home and raise the kids, which is an equally arduous task that should be respected. Uh, now, trickle-down economics has resulted in more women in the workforce and all the rest of it. That breaks down the traditional family. Teabagger Reaganism is anti-conservative. It seeks to destroy the fabric of the national community for the sake of the preservation of the wealth, power, and privileges of private sector oligarchs. So that's where I'm coming from. I saw the conservatives, the so-called conservatives, the Reaganites, the teabaggers, all those cast of characters. And I'm sorry to use strong language. It's been a long journey for me. I've seen some of it up close. It's very ugly. It's very corrupt. And it's very uh, hypocritical. And you can ask me questions on what I saw. I'd be happy to tell you. Uh, and it just really left a very bitter taste in my mouth, if you will. And that's why I reject the far left in this country, because of the hypocrisy of the extreme left, of the sort of tanky leftists, the communists and the ultra leftist types. You know, they claim they're for peace and social justice and all the rest of it, but yet they'll, in the name of so-called anti-imperialism, they will ignore the realities of the conduct of American foreign policy and will claim that the reason why Venezuela or Cuba are having problems is because of American, the so-called American embargo or economic sanctions, which is patently false in many respects, uh, in my opinion, at least. They'll claim they're for peace, but yet they'll justify the militarism of Russia and China and Cuba and North Korea and during the Cold War and after the Cold War. That I have an issue with. I saw the same thing in the right. So I have the same too. They claim they're against abortion, crime, and everything else, but their policies of trickle down and greed has expanded social maladies in the community. It's put it on steroids, where this nation was slowly improving before Reagan and the last two years of Carter, uh, this nation was improving. And then it took just took a tailspin downwards. They claim they're for a strong national security and standing up to Russia and China, but yet m m all the Republicans in the Senate, including the Tea Party Republicans, you know, the waving the flag and all the rest of it, they all went, they, they all supported the Obama, Biden, Hillary Clinton initiative of giving permanent normal trade relations to Vladimir Putin's Russia, which is basically in certain ways communist oriented behind the scenes. So that just, all these facts just disillusioned me with the right. So I felt like I had no political home. And here, this is why I'm here today. And people like Herschel and I have networked through third party Facebook groups and other third parties, bona fide third parties outside of Facebook to really get the message out there on our opinions because the views that I have and my friend Herschel, my co-host, says is very unique. You know, it's very unique for the political landscape because everybody is either Ben Shapiro or Vouch or somebody like that or, you know, somebody on the way, way left. And there are many different shades of left, too. So that's where I'm at. So one of the things I wanted to ask you two is policy related questions. Um, and then you can ask me and grill me all you want. I got my beer in hand, so I I'm chilling right now. So, um, so regarding, we're going to go through economics. Do you support capitalism or socialism? And what does capitalism and socialism mean to you? Or do you seek to transcend those two economic viewpoints? I mean, let's start with fundamentals. Sure. So what I how I would answer that question is 
my views are most consistent with that of Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who says that she has said that she's a democratic socialist, uh, which means that um, she believes that nobody should work full time and be too poor to live. So that's how I would classify my beliefs. Okay. I would say exactly the same thing, that I think for those who are working, they should be paid a living wage. There needs to be a floor below which Americans should not fall. This is an extremely wealthy country. The money is used, the, you know, our taxpayer dollars are used in ways which you know, are, let's just say, not ideal. Um, handouts to the rich, what seems like, you know, the, Martin Luther King Jr. said something like, um, America has... Uh, socialism for the rich, rugged mm -hmm. capital for the poor. Yep. And, and this is, it's very true. Right. I mean, despite all the, you know, the smoke that is put out by think tanks and the media, our taxpayer dollars go towards subsidizing wealthy people, corporations, the military industrial complex, which I understand defense is needed, but it might have overshot um, the intelligence agencies, healthcare. I mean, there's too much, but healthcare is inefficient. And you know, in the end, People don't have enough functional services. They don't have enough protections. Regulations are necessary things to prevent companies from running roughshod over the population. And America does not have those protections anymore. They have been steadily cut in the name of freedom. Uh, so that that I that I view as a problem. So I mean, capitalism I think is a fairly good system. I mean, a lot of a lot of countries are capitalist countries. America, you know, says, well, if you don't like, you know, what we have, you're a socialist. And that's simplistic. A meme said something like, uh, America calls people socialist if they are anything to the left of hunting the poor for sport, which is a really <laughs> hard. <laughs> you know, the Republicans in the last several years, you know, are trying to cut food stamps or trying to cut all sorts of things that are just needed for people to eat and to live. That's mm -hmm. just cruelty. And I feel very strongly that we should have so, a stronger social, uh, so stronger social protections because the reality yeah. is anybody could develop a disability at any time. Um, mm -hmm. Most of us, you know, if we're lucky enough, will become elderly and our health will deteriorate. And so we all, there needs to be services to help people who are elderly, people with disabilities, and yeah. just the list just goes on because the reality is a lot of things happen to people that are of no fault of their own. Exactly. And yeah. nobody True. should be in a situation where they don't have food, um, where they don't have safe drinking water. We saw that in Flint, Michigan. Um, the list just goes on and on. And I feel really strongly about social justice and economic justice. Yeah. And I would add, I mean, I, I think the term safety net is a you know, fantastic one. I think there needs to be enough of a safety net. You know, when trapeze artists or tightrope walkers are doing their thing, there's a safety net below them to prevent death. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's really what we used to have in this country. And there used to be much more uh, equal distribution of wealth. In the 50s, there was, you know, the slogan, a chicken in every pot, uh, you know, that everyone should have enough and that, you know, home um, prices for homes should be affordable. Mm -hmm. And now home ownership is, you know, really some sort of bar that a lot of people can't reach unless they, you know, bankrupt themselves or spend too much. Yeah. And also, I uh, feel pretty strongly in, uh, in, uh, uh, systems being regulated, such as banks, for example, yeah. nobody mm -hmm. should be approved a mortgage that they can't afford because mm -hmm. that would the homelessness. And so just, I believe that the government should take care of its people and protect the most vulnerable among us. Mm -hmm. and that's what governments do in, you know, in uh, Northern Europe. I mean, I really like the Northern European economies. They pay more taxes, but they get a lot of bang for the buck. They get a lot of services. They're mm -hmm. happy countries. Their mm -hmm. government cares for them. We've we've gotten so into excessive individualism and, um, uh, you know, sort of this hyper capitalism that, you know, privatization has become the norm. Privatizing up all sorts of industries and people fall through the cracks. I mean, I, I think of Texas and the electrical grid. Um, mm -hmm. you know, what happened if it failed? I mean, people were not interested in maintaining it. They wanted to reap the benefits and then, you know, have, um, and the government ended up bailing out, uh, the companies, you know, when, uh, you know, when they, when they lost money, when, um, uh, you know, when the grid failed, mm -hmm. then people had to pay exorbitant amounts of money and the government had to kind of step in. So that's not right. Now you mentioned certain things, uh, you know, all very interesting, many of which I agree with. 
And a lot of this is really not socialist because, frankly, and it, the, Bernie makes a big mistake when he calls himself a democratic socialist. Uh, and Kyle Kalinske and some of his other supporters on YouTube have pointed this out. Really, he doesn't call for the nationalization of the means of production. The Bernie of since 1990 is not the same Bernie pre-1990, as I mentioned in the show with Rohit two weeks ago. Uh, Bernie, uh, there was an analysis done and it was reported on Business Insider, which reported that Senators uh, Sanders and Elizabeth Warren's tax plans actually would not uh, result in the elimination of billionaires. And that actually makes me who started out in conservatism much more easy because I'm not for the implementation of a Marxist program in the United States. You know, Bernie has said at Liberty University and many other venues, even before becoming a presidential candidate, Bernie has sung the praises of capitalism in many ways, in many things, as he's calling it a progressive force, giving a lot of good products and services. What he objects to is the type of casino capitalism that, uh, you know, St. Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton, St. Bill Clinton, really, uh, through deregulation, uh, in union busting and financialization really brought to the fore in the United States. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the thing. So uh, I really caution the audience here not to fall prey to this view that Bernie is a real socialist. When you look at actually what the communist groups have said about Bernie, they curse him. They hate Elizabeth Warren because she is in many ways anti-communist and is a supporter to quote her directly to the bones of capitalism. And they don't like her because she voted for, you know, successive defense budgets. She rose and applauded Trump saying that America is not going to be a socialist country. Elizabeth Warren really is not a radical in many ways, at least when it comes to her rhetoric. She's actually a true centrist uh, in many ways as properly defined. Now, there are some policies and organizations that are supporter, like Council for a Liberal World and whatnot, whose programs I disagree with. But overall, you know, she is, uh, she's not like a far, far leftist. She's really not a leftist. She's a centrist, as properly defined. Certainly not a socialist. Because um, to me, socialism, you know, it's just like capitalism. There are so many varieties of socialism and capitalism. I mean, there are totalitarian variants of socialism, like in Syria under the Arabat Socialist Party or North Korea under its Korean Workers Party or whatnot. That's socialism. Germany under the Third Reich. That was an unorthodox form of socialism, if you will, uh, because the government severely micromanaged uh, private enterprises, and this whole slew of government and party are <clears throat> enterprises that existed side by side in National Socialist Germany and the Third Reich and Fascist Italy and Japan. Those are forms of socialism or extreme statism. Um, but to call simple social democratic programs that balance out capitalism, socialism, is really, uh, is really the pollution of political discourse. And that's unfortunate. Uh, and that's one of the, uh, our show, this show is an example of where we try to kind of clear out the cobwebs and the nonsense of all this kind of political discourse, pollution of our political discourse. So, um, you know, getting on to some specific issues, how would you both revitalize the tax code? I'm assuming you feel, both feel that the tax code is in dire need of an overhaul. What would both of you do? So I, speaking of Elizabeth Warren, I really like her wealth tax. Mm -hmm. I feel that corporations and billionaires um, have the ability to pay their fair share of taxes, and they should because then it benefits universal um, health care, uh, child care programs, education. And so I feel like it's not going to really impact the quality of life that a billionaire has, but it will dramatically improve the lives of children, um, you know, everyday people, the list just goes on. Now, Sarah, got a question. I just wanted to check something here. Just one little fact I got to ask. One little question I got to ask you. Didn't we have that like 40 years ago for 40, 60 years? Didn't we have that at one time or am I, is my memory shot? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, in the 50s, I mean, there was some 90% number thrown thrown around of, you know, that people had to, above a certain number, had to pay 90% of the rest of it. Uh, yeah. So you really were kind of capped in terms of how much you could make. And so we were in a socialist dictatorship then. We weren't having people being think, arrested in the streets and shot in the head and everything else, property I national. Think the general Dwight D. Eisenhower was considered a socialist, no. I'm, I'm just checking. I'm just checking. Okay. Just asking for a friend. Okay. Um, so you like the wealth tax of Elizabeth Warren and Rohit, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think um, the analogy I would make is to someone bringing home groceries and mm -hmm. the family are all excited, like, oh, all this food. And the person says, no, no, you understand. There are five bags here. Four and a half of them are for me. And he says, you know, what are we going to eat? Well, that's your problem. I'm the one that went to the store. I'm the one that earns more money. And I'm going to commandeer a, you know, a large amount of the resources. Mm -hmm. now, that's decidedly unfair. So maybe, yeah. you know, what the family could decide is, look, you can have a little bit more, but, you know, you need to, okay, you can have maybe three quarters of a bag of the groceries or one, one bag of the groceries, but everybody else needs to have, you know, at least this much. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, everyone is contributing, you know, most people are contributing to the economy. Uh, but the wealth is staying at the top. Um, you know, normally if you throw a ball in the air, you know, what goes up must come down right. unless you get stuck in a tree. And I think that's what's happening to American wealth. It is, you know, the wealth of regular people. It's getting stuck in the tree. So you would definitely support some form of progressive taxation, wealth tax or whatnot for the upper income earners, essentially. Would you incentivize certain forms of businesses through the tax code, like production, research, and development? What would you do regarding that to retain manufacturing and to re-expand the manufacturing base? Or use the tax code to incentivize corporations to pay higher wages or disincentivize financial speculation? <clears throat> what are your thoughts about that? I would say I'm not, I'm not sure of the details. What I think is important is that accountants not be used to um, you know, for corporations and the super rich to pay nothing. That seems, that's just morally offensive. Well, not just pay nothing, but get massive refunds, mm -hmm. like billions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's been a bloodletting in a sense. I mean, if you think about America's um, economy, the money that's flowing is sort of a blood supply. Some mm -hmm. people have taken a lot of the blood and sequestered it and sent it to Switzerland and mm -hmm. Cambodians, Bermuda, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, you no, know, the country's doesn't have as much. They're taking it out of circulation, hoarding well, it. Part of the problem is also the IRS also does not have the strength to and the power and the resources to uh, basically go after the tax dodgers. And that's, that's also point. incentivized in our tax code starting under Reagan and George W. Bush specifically put those benefits in the tax code for the super wealthy, the oligarchs to deposit portions of their wealth abroad. And there have been proposals to try and reverse that. And your Tea Party types like Dick Army and others fought that, actually. Um, you know, to actually jump on that, I think the idea of government being bad, which started with Reagan, you know, mm -hmm. that has that I think really found its zenith or its nadir under Trump. I mean, there's um, when, when Trump took office in 2017, as Michael Lewis writes about in the book, The Fifth Risk, all of these sort of career bureaucrats who had served across administrations, they were not political appointees, were waiting to educate the new, you know, Trumpers, whoever Trump was appointing to be heads of departments in what they knew about the government. Like, okay, I'm in the Department of Education. You know, there's a lot that I know and I, you know, I want to, I want to brief people. And they found that people weren't coming, that Trump really didn't appoint people because he wanted to starve the government so that there's less regulation and that the money that normally went to uh, bureaucrats would now be freed up to go to Trump and his cronies. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think Reagan's idea found its, you know, came to its fruition under Trump with small government and as much money going to the Betsy DeVos's of the world and, you know, just his, his cronies. Very similar to what Russia has with the, you know, their oligarchs. And I think, I think the question, you know, in January of 2021, but the insurrection was, were we going to maintain our democracy or was this going to become something of a Putin-esque uh, country where you have Trump as Putin and the oligarchs being like the senators and the other, you know, super rich? Well, I think I think with Trump, I think, and I voted for Trump and campaigned for him through 
YouTube programs and some of my writings, and Trump did not campaign. And even in interviews stretching as far back as the 1980s, he actually pushed against the sort of teabagger, Reaganite ideology of so-called limited government, which really in reality creates a vacuum where powerful private sector oligarchs then essentially can control the government and use it to their advantage. That's mm -hmm. really what this whole limited government and so-called yep. constitutionalism and everything is really about. Again, just like the far left will have their buzzwords of peace and social justice and anti-militarism, the political right will use constitutionalism, freedom, and everything else, very high-minded slogans to achieve their hidden agenda or not-so-hidden agenda, which is anything but really fealty to the founding fathers, because the found some of the founders were very critical of aspects of the Reaganite mantra. Some of them very critical of free trade. Some of them wanted a nationalized, centralized bank to disperse credits and everything else. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's, you know, Trump really campaigned as a populist uh, with certain New Deal and American School of Economic overtones. And a lot of that, unfortunately, was jettisoned as soon as he assumed office. He it, Almost like he wasn't from an outside was not interested in governing. He was more interested in tweeting. And look, there's 25 to 30 percent of I agree with Trump's administration on. It's not to say I'm like totally like never Trump. And if he's right about something, I'll never admit it. But the other problem is, is the other 75 percent was a betrayal of his agenda. If he didn't absorb these Reaganites into his government, um, I think his presidency would have been a different story because Trump was a very is a very malleable character um, and his mind could be easily changed and that is documented. Uh, and would, he didn't really govern from a certain ideology. I mean, well, he, he was really didn't. He, he was like a rubber band. His family and his friends. He was looking for good deals. Basically, for me, to, you know, in India, you have a lot of corruption where um, at various levels of bureaucracy, people are like to do my job, you have to pay me. You've got to you got to bribe me to do my job, and mm -hmm. you renegotiated deals and said, "Okay, what's in it for me? Now mm -hmm. I have control, and uh, you know you got to pay me or my family, and you know either directly or some you know shady indirect way in order to you know get what you want." Well, there definitely was a kleptocracy involved. There was even one conservative writer, I forget the, his name off the top of my head, and he basically summarized the Trump presidency pretty well in very harsh terms. And the guy was a populist conservative, a good writer. And uh, yeah, there definitely was kleptocracy involved and corruptions, no doubt about that. But, you know, as one of, um, I think it was either a, a an official of ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, which is a very loathsome corporate corporate globalist organization that, by the way, champions trade with communist countries, by the way, it sanctions like the bills. conservative hypocrisy at its finest. Yeah. They uh, said that Trump was a, uh, a blank slate. I think it was either Alec or Koch Network. They said Trump was a blank slate. And really, a lot of his opinions on most issues, not all, but most issues were relatively unformed. And they took advantage of that. And that is really, to me, one of the tragedies of the Trump presidency. In fact, I call the Trump presidency, I've termed it a train wreck of lost opportunities. And, you know, really with Trump, uh, really after the Trump experience, really I could not support the Republicans ever again unless they really revert they dump Reaganism and readopt the platform of, let's say, somebody like Teddy Roosevelt, who opposed the oligarchs of the right as well as the communists of the left. So moving on, I, I get the impression that both of you are very strong supporters of labor unions. Um, can you expand on your labor union program that you both support? How would you increase the appeal and strength of labor unions in this country? I think it would be to dispel the myth that labor unions are not good for everybody. The truth is, even though I don't belong to a union right now, I benefit, I benefit from teachers unions, um, just, uh, just all sorts of unions. For example, the five-day work week, having sick time, it's just the reality is labor unions do so much to help to help people and just really to 
um, just to inform people that labor unions really are great for workers and mm-hmm. for people who aren't billionaires. And they're just um, just such a great resource and really they advocate for the workers. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll go upstream a bit and say that I think Washington is pretty broken, that it's run by lobbyists. And like we were saying with Trump, you got to pay me to get anything done. Po- you know, politicians, they rubber stamp Alex bills. They do whatever, <clears throat> whatever's pro industry. They take lobbyist money. And, you know, I, I think there's been a disconnection of the politicians from their constituents' needs. Mm. And, you know, so the, so the leverage that people used to have in terms of, um, you know, a group of people are saying, hey, this is a problem. You know, we want you to represent us in Washington and fix it. You know, I, I think politicians at this point campaign on what the people say they want. And then once they get to Washington, they are, you know, just beholden to lobbyists. And I think, you know, um, along along with this trend, I think labor unions have been effectively neutralized and to some degree busted. Um, certainly the, you know, the the narrative is that unions are greedy, uh, but it's, it's quite the opposite. I mean, unions are trying to protect those who don't have that kind of collective bargaining power, don't have the actual power and money. So there there's, you know, there's um, strength in numbers. And if you are negating their influence, you are exposing individual workers to just whatever it is the oligarchs want. And that you've seen this with, you know, low minimum wage. The productivity has risen significantly since 1980. Uh, cost of living has cost of living has risen significantly since 1980. But the minimum wage really hasn't gone up. So one has to work, you know, two jobs often just to make ends meet. And when we find that, well, very- wait a minute, wait a minute, well, wait a minute. The party of family values supports all these trickle down economics. The party of family values. So I'm a little confused about that. Anyways, go ahead. I like to. Be, I'm very sarcastic. In case There's you know. nothing. Nothing trickles down. The ball gets stuck in the tree. So I'd also add that it's not. Sometimes it's not even just two jobs. Sometimes it's three or four jobs. Yeah. We're working a hundred plus hours a week just to be able to have enough to eat, so they don't starve. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Precisely. Yeah, and I, and I, I work with the poor, and you know there are lots of working poor. I mean there are lots of kids who you know. So if I'm a child psychiatrist, and there are lots of working poor. Um, I, you know, often will schedule appointments after 5 p.m. with the kids that I uh, see and treat because their parents are working and mm-hmm. the parents are, you know, they're apologetic. They're like, I know, you know, this is going to be late. And I said, no, it's fine. You're feeding your family. I understand you're not available from nine to five. That's OK. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thank you so much for understanding because they're they're just trying to get by. And it's just not fair. I mean, you know, recently we've seen the news that um uh, fast food restaurants are complaining that their workers are not returning. Uh, they're saying these people are too lazy to work. Actually, these people realize that they're worth more, uh, that it's what they're being paid is humiliating. Mm-hmm. So they're voting with their feet and they're saying, well, unemployment is good enough for me to keep going and I'm not going to come back to work for you. So the rest exactly. of them, they start raising minimum wage and I mean, minimum wage should be raised throughout the country. I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot to be done with that. But, um, and there also needs to be unions because stronger unions, in my opinion, and the repeal of right to work, Section 14B of Taft Hartley, needs by constitutional order and the implementation of Franklin Roosevelt's second Bill of Rights. And that needs to invalidate right to work across the board because right to work, when you look at the history of right to work, it started as a result of a globalists and the National Association of Manufacturers in the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, who, by the way, were big proponents even during the Cold War of trade with the Soviet Union, China, and everything else, by the way. So your professional anti-socialist people who say, oh, we hate socialism, well, you know, your right to work program, supported by groups that had no problem with trading with socialist despotisms who wanted to conquer the United States. But, but I digress. Second part is, is right to work also started, guys, look up the word, I'm saying to the audience, guys, not you, uh, Vance Muse. Vance Muse was a gentleman who started right to work in his Christian educational association or what, what have you. And Vance Muse was a gentleman who was a virulent racist, I think from Texas or Arkansas. And he started the whole right to work movement in the 40s. Why? Because the Southern segregationists, the ones that were not populists, by the way, or pro labor, there were a lot of segregationists that were populist and pro labor, but there was also ones that were not. 
And those awful Bourbon Democrats, the anti-populist racists, they were totally straight tripping. They were upset that African Americans and Caucasian Americans were fighting together to try and win worker rights. They were told, they were like really nervous about that. Yeah, there's a class war in this country and there has been. Yeah. Exactly. So they use right to work as divide and conquer. I refer you back to Dr. Martin Luther King's discussion and speech where he talked about the whole history of how black and white in the Reconstruction era tried to get together in a patriotic populism to win their labor rights, better working conditions, working together, crossing that color bar. And boom, the oligarchs in the South, you know, those reactionary, globalist, awful Bourbon Democrats, the former slaveholders, um, put the kibosh on that. And this is back 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, and into the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And they crushed a multiracial populist coalition that was developing. Why? By using race to divide them. And Martin Luther Dr. King talked about this and gave, gave a great speech about this. I talked about it, Herschel and I talked about it in one of our programs. So what we need to do is that culture needs to be broken. And the only way to do that is basically through massive federal intervention. And we really have to also, and it may have to come through extreme economic pain and a national catastrophe, but there has to be a reconfiguration of our government and constitution uh, to reflect truly nationalist and populist impulses uh, for the nation at large. And the only way we can successfully battle the globalist oligarchs and prevent uh, from socialism and communism from becoming more and more appealing for our younger people is through a multiracial civic nationalist and populist coalition. I know that's a pipe dream. I don't know how to necessarily implement that, but I do know that is a prescription that really could work. But I have to stress it has to be multiracial. We're it's a hard. nation of we're a nation of immigrants. Yeah. We're a diverse nation, whether you like it or not. Me personally, I embrace it in my personal life. Some of the audience and some of my friends know that. It's a reality. So let's just, just go with it. Mm -hmm. and that's it. A company that shall not be named, uh, but is the most you know, one of the most profitable companies in the US, um, was you know, was hearing about uh, people unionizing in Alabama. And they started putting anti-union propaganda in the bathrooms and all sorts of things and trying to you know, spy on these meetings. They have an incentive to try to block the rise of you know, this sort of um, you know, populism or this, you know, these kinds of uh, coalitions. So they will do whatever they can because you know, keeping their gravy train going is very important to them. They don't want the money to flow down. They don't want there to be equality. They're those who are absolutely invested in you know, this pyramidal structure where they at the top reap the benefits and other people do a lot of the work. And the thing is, is I'm not for economic equality, a total leveling effect. I mean, I'm, no. we're all three of us are not for that. There are natural inequalities present in people, but it's not sustainable and not healthy for a civilization and a strong nation to have this extreme levels of inequality. Because yeah. again, it's a breeding ground for radicalism, which is growing. That's anti-capitalist and socialist and fascist. It causes loss of purchasing power, which affects the economy. It breaks up families. It's not conducive. Sorts of societal indicators start to go down. Once you, the greater inequality there is, the worse the you know economic, physical, mental health of the country is. Precisely. Precisely. Um, substance abuse goes up. Um, homelessness goes up. I mean, everything starts to crumble. So, you know, it, it behooves people to have some purchasing power uh, and those at the top need to you know, let go of some of their, their wealth. Yeah, I think that what you really are getting at is this quote, everyone does better when everyone does better. And that is just so true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What are your positions on free trade, protectionism, economic nationalism, tariffs, and whatnot? Do you think the United States can survive as a nation based on innovation, 
as well as in, from a national security perspective uh, with our degraded manufacturing base. What are your thoughts on manufacturing and free trade? I will say I know what I don't know, and that is one area I do not know much about. I'm, I'm not someone who has really followed uh, trade policy. So what I does your gut tell you? What does your gut tell you? You're a very, I always known you as a very intelligent guy. So it says uh, that what is your gut? Delicious. Um, yeah, my, my gut says that it wants to be fed more of what it was just fed. It doesn't have any particular um, position on trade. Um, so, my, so wait a minute. So you don't want me to make you a T-bone steak when you come down and visit Florida or something? <laughs> are you trying to? Are you just trying to tell me that? Hmm? Steak is fine. Just don't T-bone my car. That's all. Good comeback. Good right. comeback. Sarah, what do you got for me? Yeah. So my gut tells me um, that I really should learn more about how trade issues impact us. I know that, like, with being a more global, everything's becoming more global. I just know it really has a profound impact on all of us. And so that makes me want to learn more about trade agreements, NAFTA. Like, I just know they're negotiated all the time, but I really, it's not something that I know a lot about, but it's certainly something that I know profoundly impacts me, even if I don't know a lot about them. Well, it's profoundly impact us, both, uh, you know, uh, Rohit and I as being former New Yorkers, Sarah, I think you're originally from Massachusetts. And the concept of the Maquiladoras, the runaway factories, have left uh, many towns, communities, cities devastated. Uh, <clears throat> even in New York City, um, in northeast Staten Island, for example, near the Howland Hook Container Terminal near the Gothels Bridge, there used to be a Procter & Gamble factory. Uh, that was outsourced uh, in 1992 uh, to Mexico and causing a, quite a bit of unemployment and lost capital uh, away from the United States. You have the Swing Line Stapler Factory. I remember it uh, off the Long Island Railroad in Long Island City. Uh, that fled to Mexico as a result of NAFTA back in 1996 or 1997, which was reported in the New York Times, uh, as a matter of fact. You have plant closures, steel mills shutting down and uh, uh, across the Delaware River in Trenton because of steel dumping from a variety of foreign countries who subsidize their steel industry, incentivize the production of steel while we're just playing around with casino derivatives, financial crap and everything else, which is, of course, encouraged by Reaganite globalists and Clinton and whatnot. So, you know, we're wasting our time with that and we're importing steel from Russia and China or about enemies and whatnot. The problem with trade policy, uh, it harms our national security by indeed industrializing the United States. We would, it's impossible for us generals and into other industry insiders have said that we cannot retool as far back as the 70s and the 1970s and 1980s, we could not retool ourselves to fight a prolonged war against a powerful enemies like Russia and China, even back then the Soviet Union. You had generals complaining that under Reagan, they didn't listen enough about that. Uh, all in the name of libertarian free trade and engagement and everything else, which is just a lot of horse feathers, in my opinion. The other part of trade is, is that we have foreign policy elites ever since Truman had the theory that if we allow countries to dump their products into the American market, that they'll become bound to us and become more of allies of the United States. Well, West Germany and Japan were the worst violators of COCOM regulations that controlled technology exports to the communist world. Uh, so, and continue to be, particularly Germany, uh, a very bad offender when it comes to high-tech exports at times to Iran and Russia, for example, or in China. So, just because we are attached to the hip and dependent on trade, close trade with quote-unquote allied countries, well, these allied countries have their own business interests. And they have their own, what they perceive as their natural interests, and that's going to diverge from American foreign policy, where it really shouldn't, because it's not in their long-term interests to trade with the enemies of NATO, if you will, China, or Russia, and everything else. Our economy has, I mean, America is the world's largest arms manufacturer, so mm -hmm. we're weapons. 
Uh, we also, you know, have moved away from a manufacturing-based uh, economy to a services-based economy. And so, you know, we can oh, design our own food. We can generally produce our own food. But I was just looking out of curiosity at the mug that I had here. And of course, it's made in China. So, I mean, a lot of the things that we import, you know, the physical items are made in China because China has a lot of manufacturing and we are content to do less the manufacturing and have other countries do more of it. You know, they have people who, you know, don't get paid as much. I mean, India, Bangladesh, China, I mean, you know, the, 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 um, the wages are fairly low in some of these industries. So it's cheaper for the world to have these countries do the manufacturing in America. You know, Americans do higher level things overall. I mean, that has been a shift. Uh, so the steel plants have closed. You know, I mean, farming. And steel know. actually was higher level in many ways because as the steel industry has developed over time, there was a lot of there's a lot of more technology involved with steel production, a lot of automation and whatnot. And we really, because we were paralyzed by a free trade ideology uh, in the leadership of both parties, as well as neoliberalism and this view that government is never the solution and only the problem while other countries were working with their corporations to expand and modernize steel and electronics, we were falling behind. And a lot of the higher end uh, technology, I mean, that was also exported to those jobs, those factories were also exported. Computers in Florida very hard. You look at the studies of the Economic Policy Institute, Robert Scott, for example, uh, Florida, free trade and globalization has devastated Florida's uh, technology base. A lot of the jobs that left Florida were uh, in computers and technology, same in California, for example. So actually, really and truly, as a result of globalization, we have gotten the proliferation and really a dependency on low-wage service work. Mm -hmm. This is all done by design. This is not because, yeah. this is not because, you know, this is a natural evolution. No, this was done by specific design for yeah. this specific agenda and uh you, this is again you, go ahead Rohit. What i would say yeah say companies something? and industries have said you know it's you know we're going to do what's best for us we are not interested in the you know economic health of the whole nation what's good for us as a company to optimize profits is to outsource these to you know india or to china and you know there's not a whole lot that the government has done to try to block this because, again, the government has not been into regulation. And when this right. continues to happen, then a lot of jobs go overseas. And, and it goes to enemies. I mean, Russia is not a friendly country. I would not feel secure exporting industry and allowing our industries to die and then it being replaced by imports of Russian steel or Russian oil, for example. I mean, Boeing, example, they uh, shifted their design center, research and development, back under the George W. Bush administration to the Russians, as a matter of fact. Right. Russia was not a friendly country then, yeah. Uh, yeah, under Bush, uh, despite yeah. what Bush said. So, again, this really begs to the issue, I think we could all agree, granted, in some ways, I come from more of a nationalist perspective that where the accent is truly on the nation, you know, flag waving patriotism and whatnot. No, not to denigrate anything both of you represent. You come from more of a liberal point of view, but at the same time, you are concerned about the nation. You said that both of you have said that several times. And I think that's where kind of we meet an ex-conservative and a and uh, left progressive social Democrats such as yourselves where we kind of have common values because I think we could all agree that at times the capitalists, and I mean the big capitalists, the oligarchs, they, they need to be disciplined for the lack of a better word and told what to do by the state by the federal state. And that's a very nationalist view. And if people say, well, you live in Europe, fascist. Well, you know what? Just pound sand because these same precious private sector oligarchs that you love, they have no problem doing business with quote unquote fascist communist governments worldwide. So it's like, you know, stop going to bat for them. You either want the country to survive our national security, national community to survive or not. So when we segue into, because I've been touching a lot on national security themes, 